The Pacers look totally miserable against the Raptors until they don't, until they have an amazing best of the season fourth quarter to come back and beat Toronto for a three and one homestand all against playoff teams. We'll talk about how they beat Toronto. Miles Turner's great play on this homestand and Daniel Tice having surgery on his knee to get healthy all today on the Locked On Pacers podcast. You are Locked On Pacers, your daily Indiana Pacers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome in to another edition of the Locked On Pacers podcast, where we, of course, talk about the Indiana Pacers as always. My name's Tony East. I cover the team for Forbes and SI, and today... Fun weekend in Pacerland as they beat the Raptors in a very weird game. They looked horrible in the first half, ugliest half of the Pacers season, not necessarily by score, but by disposition and effort and just good-looking basketball. It looked horrible, but they won. They smoked the Raptors in the second half to get it done. We'll talk about that game. We'll talk about the homestand that Miles Turner just had because, wow, was he great for the Pacers in their last four games. And then a short segment to end it because Daniel Tice had surgery to repair some issues with his right knee. We'll talk about all that, what it means for the Pacers on today's show. we got to talk about the fun game from Saturday night over the weekend. Pacers beat the Raptors 118-104 to wrap up a 3-1 and homestand all against playoff teams. Very impressive form the Pacers are in right now, and they keep winning games in a way that they haven't done up to that point, which is interesting. They beat the Heat because they finally defended really well. They beat the Raptors this game because... It was their first win where they were trailing entering the fourth quarter. I think that's a pretty big deal. Uh, and so the Pacers figure out how to get that done, which is noteworthy because their first half in this game was completely miserable. Completely miserable. And it wasn't – they were down 13. That's, like, bad but not embarrassing. But what made it bad is stuff that Rick Carlisle talked about after the game, right? They are trying to build a certain type of culture that does not involve sulking, does not involve letting stuff happen to them, does not involve not fighting back, right? They just looked miserable, and it was – both an attitude thing, you know, slumped shoulders. Just the, the Raptors would just throw it in the post and score and crash the glass, and there was no effort on the box outs. And, you know, Rick Carlisle tried random rotation stuff to try to get through it and some sulking on the bench and a lot of bickering with officials. Like, it looked horrible, and the Pacers played horrible. They fouled 15 times in the first half, which, in the, to a basketball perspective, took them out of their game. It was so arrhythmic. They couldn't get into what they wanted to get into when the Raptors shoot 20 one free throws and a half. They also turned it over 12 times. Like they shot better from the field than Toronto. They shot better from three than Toronto. They did okay on the glass, right? They had more assists. They were playing fine when they could actually play, but the game was so broken up and arrhythmic that they couldn't play the way they wanted. And their attitude reflected that. And Rick Carlisle came in at halftime and said, this is not who we are. This is not the Pacers we want to be. Let's figured this stuff out. And Tyrese Halberton talked after the game as well, and he said that's th that first half is how Toronto wants to play, right? They were without Siakam. They're without uh, Fred Van Vliet, so they, ha they are low on resources, but th they want to play that way every game. They have all these giant dudes, and they want to pressure you the second you catch the ball, and they want to make your life hell, and so that you get frustrated, and you foul, and you give up at times. And they the Pacers don't want that to happen to them. And in the second half, they fixed everything. They looked awesome, awesome, awesome in the second half. And that was fascinating to see for the Pacers because like Tyrese Halbert and said after the game, the Pacers are finally showing a little bit of growth and learning kind of stuff, right? He said that he, this is Halbert's words because I know fans will think this sounds excusey. Um, you know, they were up 18 and a half time against Denver. They're not used to playing with leads, right? They, they mentally shifted incorrectly and did not play well in the second half and they lost, right? So this was a big mental game for a team that is learning how to overcome not playing the one they want to play, getting kicked in the butt by a team with a bunch of size, you know, getting through all that was big for this team. So in the, in the second half, you know, after the turnovers, after getting through the fouls, they looked really, really good. Carlisle got through the frustrations. They figured it all out. They were the aggressors. That's how I would describe it. And that's how the Pacers have described a lot of their success this season, right? In first quarters early in the season, they were getting their butts kicked. And they all said the same thing. We're being reactive. We're not being the aggressors. In the second half of this game, I think the Pacers were the aggressors, right? Third quarter, Jalen Smith and Miles Turner really got it going for the Pacers. They were key in helping the Pacers fight back. Jalen Smith hitting a couple of threes to start off the quarter. Miles Turner had nine points, four rebounds, and a block. Didn't miss a shot. 
the entire frame. And then Benedict Matherin finally got it going off the bench. He didn't hit a shot in the first half, I believe. I don't have that in front of me. But he had seven points in the quarter as well. So after really struggling, Pacers come out in this third quarter. And finally, everybody basically starts to click. They start fighting the way they want to fight. They start finding ways to free up a little space when they catch the ball so Toronto's not right in their face. And this other weird thing they did in the first half is, and because they were out of their game and they had foul trouble, they were trying a bunch of stuff, they tried to line up with none of Matherin, Heald, and Halliburton. And they'd only tried that for 15 minutes in their first 10 games in total, right? Like 1.5 minutes per game. And they tried it for a really long stretch. It was awful. It did not go well at all. So they finally got Matherin going in, the, in this third quarter. That really helped them come back. And Turner was really fantastic. I go back to him because in my notes, I note that Halberton said after the game, it felt like Miles Turner got every rebound in this game. Uh, and so he was really good in the third quarter. And yet, they were still down eight points entering the fourth. They still had to pull a Pacers thing they hadn't done yet and win a game where they're trailing entering the fourth. Momentum or not, they still had to do it, right? Toronto's got some weapons. That's why they scored 65 points in the first half. OG and Anobi had a tremendous game uh, in this one. Thad Young did Thad Young stuff all night. Scotty Barnes was the rookie of the year last year. You still have to do it. And the fourth quarter, they were even better than the third quarter. And they did it on both ends this time. This was one of their most complete quarters of the season. 36 points scored. That's really good, no matter what. But 14 points allowed. That is what made this so special. They did this in the Heat game where they defended well down the stretch. This was even a step above that. Toronto scored 11 points in nine and a half minutes to open this quarter. The Pacers just completely smothered them on the defensive end. And what makes that so useful for this Pacers team, I've talked about this a lot, Tyrese said this at Media Day, is the way they want to play, where they want to get out in transition, they want to run down your throat, they're so fast, they want to get to early offense, that is a more effective strategy if you're in transition a lot and you're getting stops. And so it just has this snowball effect where they get a stop, they score in transition, now the other team's bringing it up slow. It's easier to get a stop and run in transition, and it just goes and goes and goes, so that in this fourth quarter, that snowball effect kept going, and going and going, and they looked awesome. It was one of their better quarters I've seen this season uh, among many. I feel like I've seen that a lot recently, but they had a lot of great quarters in their homestand, right? Uh, so Buddy Heald, fourth quarter, doesn't miss a shot. Isaiah Jackson, fourth quarter, doesn't miss a shot. Benedict Matherin, fourth quarter, doesn't miss a shot. Those guys combined for 22 points without missing. That's obviously huge. Jackson had a sick lefty dunk in that quarter. Matherin was making it happen. And Buddy Heald, his points came kind of at the end of this game. You know, if you the, his stat line doesn't match his impact perfectly, but his eight points were like the dagger eight points. He put the Raptors away. Those guys not missing was huge. TJ McConnell's fourth quarter, unheralded for a lot of reasons. Five assists in just the fourth quarter for TJ McConnell, who after a little slump in like their third through eighth game, just making numbers up. But like their midseason of whatever they've played so far, he's kind of emerged from that and has looked better recently. And Tyrese Halliburton finally got it going. He hit both of it. He only made two shots in this game, but both of them were in the fourth quarter, which allowed him to emerge looking great in the plus minus department. He only had eight points, be 15 assists. So uh, he still drew a bunch of defensive attention all night. That's why he was able to have so many assists. It's not like him missing shots detracted a ton from his impact. Obviously, making shots is better than not, but he figured it out. And the one unsung hero of the fourth quarter, Rick Carlisle talked about his professionalism after the game. O'Shea Brissett comes in. And after last Tuesday talking with Eddie Garrison about how he hadn't hit a two-pointer yet this season, he hit three in the fourth quarter alone, two drives to the basket, a dunk in transition, huge stretch that cut the lead for Toronto from eight to one he was a part of. He was really good. Got a ton of praise from Carlisle after the game for his professionalism, to not keep, to not sulk when he wasn't playing, to keep grinding and getting better, and then to come in and play well and cheer on his teammates, which, again, seems like basic stuff that everybody should be doing, but that's not the case always. In the NBA, Brissett always has done that, and he came in, and finally, after struggling offensively this season, his defense has been fine, um, got it going on both ends, and was a huge, huge part of that fourth quarter run, plus 11 for Brissett and eight minutes in the fourth quarter, definitely his best stretch of the season, not even close second. So um, an unsung hero combined with guys who are normal heroes. It, does it count? It's just a thing I just thought of this. People say unsung hero, and it's like, I don't expect if, if, like, Benedict Matherin has a big game and they win, is he a sung hero? You know, just like a normal one. Anyway, uh, they won a huge fourth quarter. Their defense was fantastic. They completely found their groove. They defended this exhausted Raptors team uh, perfectly, perfectly for 12 minutes. It was one of their best defensive stretches of the season. And they get a win. Back to 6-6. Six and six. Pacers 500. And by virtue of tiebreakers, sixth in the Eastern Conference for cupcake, air quotes, because the NBA is loaded right now. Loaded right now. 
Uh, but cupcake opponents coming up in Houston and Charlotte and Orlando twice at home. There's a chance that the Pacers can go three and one in that stretch and be over 500 uh, after 15 games. They are sitting pretty right now after a fantastic homestand in this Raptors game where they they figured out what they were doing wrong at halftime. They got with their culture and they just played an awesome half of basketball. Got them back to where they are now. So impressive stuff from the Pacers on Saturday. Really impressed with what I saw from Brissett uh, and and Ben Matherin in the second half of that game. They were two tide changing players, but really everybody did. Every single player I think who got minutes in the second half did played their role well to some extent in that half, and that's what it takes to have a comeback like that. Even Aaron Neesmith hit, hit double digits after an O for night in his first game back from injury. Everybody who played did well, and that's credit to the whole Pacers team. Speaking of guys who did well. Uh, Miles Turner, his homestand, ridiculous. He's playing so well right now, and I want to talk about the numbers and the reasons behind it because Miles Turner is secretly having quite a good season. Before we do that, though, guys, i got to talk to you about LinkedIn jobs. These days, every new potential hire can feel like a high-stakes wager for your small business. You want to be 100% certain that you have access to the best qualified candidates available. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn jobs. LinkedIn jobs help find the right people for your team faster and for free. You just hop on there, click a few easy links, and boom, you've posted your job on LinkedIn Jobs. You can add a purple job hiring frame to your LinkedIn profile, which helps spread the word that your company is hiring. They have simple tools like screening questions to make it easy for candidates with just the right skills and experience to get to your position and apply. That's why small businesses rate LinkedIn Jobs number one in delivering high-quality hires versus leading competitors. And right now, LinkedIn Jobs can help you find qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash LockedOnNBA. That's linkedin.com slash LockedOnNBA. Post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. Thanks, everybody, as always, for making Locked On Pacers your first listen today and every single day. For your second listen, hop on over to Locked On Raptors. Hear what Sean Woodley has to say about that game and that Raptors team that I didn't even know this. Played five games in seven nights, ending with a back-to-back in Indy. Brutal scheduling for that Toronto team, but the Pacers took advantage and played very, very well to get that win. And one guy who played well again, Mr. Miles Turner. Miles Turner in that game, 19 points on five of eight shooting, 19 points on eight shots for Miles Turner, eight free throw attempts. Again, he is feasting at the line, 10 boards, two blocks, one third of the team's blocks, plus 14, second highest on the Pacers. And all that only came in 27 minutes because of foul trouble that the Pacers were dealing with in the first half. When you have 15 fouls and a half, uh, everybody, <laughs> basically everybody was in foul trouble for the Pacers. When I was, I, I so story for the way most journalist people who have to cover a game and write a story right after the game works, they'll start writing at halftime usually. Like get some of the game story stuff in there and some stat stuff. And I was writing about a Pacers loss spearheaded by foul trouble. So I had to change up the story quite a bit. But uh, you know that is how this game kind of went. But Turner... A rose above it. Excellent second half, right? Halliburton said he said he felt like Miles Turner was getting all these rebounds and his defense was good. And both of his blocks were game changers in the second half of this game. And obviously, eight free throws is fantastic. So I want to dive into what Turner's doing recently because, first and foremost, 10 rebounds again. That's not like a ton or anything for a center. Double digits is still good. But Turner's not been a guy in his career who's known for his rebounding. He's an okay box out guy, I've always thought, but he's never been good at just going up and getting the thing. And this stretch of home games, he has been good at going up and getting the thing. Three straight games of double-digit rebounds for Turner. First time he's done that since February of 2020. I think I was going through it. I don't have, I don't, I didn't type the exact number, but I think he's done this three straight games less than five times his entire career, right? He is confident and getting the ball and doing his thing. And that's why I wanted to really. Really dive because that, among many stats, shows how well he's playing. Like Buddy Hield stole the scoring title in this game late by canning eight points in the final like four minutes or something. If he didn't, Turner would have led the team in blocks, points, and rebounds in the win against Toronto. Right? He was absolutely cooking, and now his stats look fantastic this season. Right? Miles Turner is currently at seventeen point nine points per game, eight point seven rebounds per game, three point one blocks per game. He's shooting fifty point seven percent from the field, thirty seven percent from deep. That number will go down. I presume, but still at this time, he's looking great. And ever since his awful, awful, cannot overlook it, awful level game in Brooklyn, like maybe the worst game of his, <laughs> well, I don't know about his whole career. One of the worst games of his whole career. Pacers come back home for this homestead and Miles Turner just kicked some butt. I and mean, he has, was fantastic in the four game sense. Double, double average. So Turner 
In the four-game homestand, 21.5 points per game, 10.0 rebounds per game, 2.8 blocks. He shot 61% from the field, 44% from deep, and 85% from the foul line on seven free throw attempts per game. Who is this guy? Seven free throw attempts per game is not the Miles Turner that is normally known. He has been absolutely crushing it and doing more than, as he said last year, right? I still think about this with Turner a lot. Maybe I overthink it because the team has changed so much. He's clearly more involved. He made the comments about feeling like a glorified role player on the old Pacers team. He wanted to be more involved. He called it a, wanting a promotion. This is what I imagine he was hoping he could be asked to do more often. You know, I say that because of some of the numbers he's putting up, but the big one being usage, right? How much is he getting the ball? Getting the chance to finish plays and be good. 22.3% usage. That is Miles Turner's highest of his career by about 2% his career average, 19%, right? Given the chance to do stuff on offense. And that extends to a lot of things, right? As the center around the basket more often, they're asking him to dive and cut more. He's around the rim more. So his rebound rate is a career high by a mile. Again, right? His career rebound rate, 13% this season, 16.8%, especially high on the defensive end, offensive end, about where he's been for his whole career, right? He's just, like I said, Going up and getting the thing. A guy who's led the league in block percentage twice, Miles Turner, is currently at a career-high block percentage, right? He's swatting shots away and a high percentage of the Pacers' blocks. His numbers just look fantastic. They look as good as they've looked in a while over the course of the season. Now, let's not get too far ahead of myself. It's only been seven games. Two of them have been real stinkers, and Miles Turner in his whole career has had consistency issues. I don't want to get ahead of myself. I just want to evaluate what he's doing well and that he's doing it on a higher usage because this is sort of what he's wanted for his whole career. And I don't know if it's sustainable. In fact, I would suspect that it's not, but I have been very impressed with the way he's played. And I think that for a guy that's always wanted to be this, stepping up to the call and actually doing it when he's given the chance is impressive and very noteworthy for a guy that's wanted more opportunity basically for four or five seasons now. Uh, so some more numbers just because I was digging through Miles Turner numbers today because he's playing well and doing it in a way he very rarely has in his career. This season, from zero to three feet at the rim, whatever you want to call it, Miles Turner, 81.8%, 82% basically. He's dunking more, which is something he does when he's confident. He's getting more open dunks because this offensive ecosystem is good for him, and he's taking a lot of his shots at the rim, 29.3%. That would be the third highest of his career, although basically the second highest of his career behind the Bjorkren season when they varied up his style a little bit more when he was in the game, right? Again, he's rolling more and cutting more. And I think that's been big for him, right? As a pop guy for his whole career, he has the athleticism to, to actually skate through the lane a little bit. Halliburton can find him no matter what he does. That has been really, really good for him in terms of getting more shot variety. Uh, and so this team he currently has, he fits really well. And then the other factor of usage, right? Usage rate kind of measures you, you finishing the play, right? You taking the shot, you whatever, turnover, drawing foul, just raw touches, right? You know, if you're a role player, you don't touch the ball very much. And if you do, you're like expected to shoot or pass right away. Miles Turner last year with the Pacers finished with, oh my gosh, what? 36.1 touches per game. That was behind Justin Holiday. That was behind Lane Stevenson. That was behind a ton of guys. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine guys ahead of Miles Turner and touches per game on the Pacers last season. This year, he's up to 47.4 touches per game. That's third on the team. Only Tyrese and Buddy Heald are ahead of him. They're involving Miles Turner, and he's making it happen, right? That would have been, like, after his third game, I believe, fourth, third, uh, the, the the second Brooklyn game where he was terrible. Yeah, that was his third game of the season. He'd had two rough, rough nights, right? For a guy that his whole career has wanted the exact role he has now, basically, and has asked to not be a glorified role player and needed to step up, and now is taking on leadership responsibilities, like, he had to be good this year. Or else it would have been like, there, there's no more cards to discuss for him of, well, here's what he thinks he can do, Right. He actually is doing it right now. Will it hold up? I don't know. But he had to kind of do this to, to prove to other people that you know there were a lot of contextual things in his career he's always talked about. And he's, for now, meeting them. Again, I don't think he'll he'll reach this level and these stats for the whole season. But right now, it's been very impressive. So the, the question is, and as it's been for a lot of his career, can he keep doing it, right? And I think he can do better than his past stats suggest. Like closer, you know, remember his second season, he was finishing really well around the rim, looking like this really promising big. That's still, <laughs> to this day, his second highest scoring per game season and his highest field goal percentage, things like that, right? Like closer to those numbers. I think he'll exceed those. Like he's a better player than that now. 
Uh, but closer to those numbers, I think, would be big for him. Can the consistency remain, too? That's a big thing for him as well, right? Will there be any fluctuations? Because he's had those two bad games. That has to matter. You have to think about that. He's only played seven. But the four-game homestand was so impressive to the point to me that I'm thinking, okay, you know, how much better is Miles Turner in this role, and what can the Pacers learn from that? How can they keep making sure he's in advantageous positions all the time so he can continue to be this player who is both confident enough and in positions to succeed enough to average a double-double over a four-game homestand? Because that is, quite frankly, you know, for like I said, five or fewer times in his whole career has he had consecutive three consecutive or more games of 10-plus rebounds. He has done it before, right? This isn't like so abnormal, but it's, it's, it's rare. And so... Can he keep this up? Can this style continue to work for him in the Pacers? I think it can. It's just how often will he continue to do it? Because right now, he's been very good. So impressive to me. So impressive to me. Probably, ugh, I don't want to rank the best to worst Pacer, but one of the best Pacers this season, especially during this homestand, and on both ends of the floor. Just an absolutely massive player, putting up the stats, doing what he's always said he could do. And I think that's been key because he's always said it, but he's never done it this year. Finally, finally putting action to match the words. We'll see if he can keep it up. Uh, Charlotte coming up, a team he has historically done well against. And Houston, a team that has bigs that he should be able to do well against. But we will see how much that actually maintains and actually matters as the season progresses. All right. Let's talk about Daniel Tice. Because Daniel Tice had surgery at the end of last week. Couldn't fit it in on a segment for this team. But it definitely matters to talk about to me, just to keep up, keep you guys updated on that, it'll be a little shorter segment to get you out of here uh, and talk about what it means for the Pacers. Before we do that, though, let me talk to you guys about BetOnline.net, your number one source for sports betting info, stats, news, and analysis. You can get the latest odds and trends for every professional and amateur league out there, from football to basketball to soccer and esports. They've got it all at BetOnline.net. And if you love sports podcasts, they've got those at BetOnline as well. They're always the fastest and easiest way to get your betting fix with lines for everything. Monday Night Football, Eagles favored by 11 over the Commanders. Last time I checked, the Eagles are undefeated. That seems like it should matter. And this, they've got Colts signs up for next week. All that and more over at BetOnline.net. Head over to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more because BetOnline is where the game starts. Thank you, as always, for making Locked On Pacers your first listen today and every single day. For your second listen, check out Locked On Sports today. Hear the latest and greatest from around the sports world from our experts here at the Locked On Podcast Network. Biggest stories they've got at Peter Burkowski killing it, hosting that show in 20 minutes or less every single day on the Odyssey app, wherever you get podcasts, or YouTube, Locked On Sports today. Go check it out. Minor news thing to get to here. Um, this surprised me. This came out of nowhere. Daniel Tice had surgery last week. Daniel Tice uh, out indefinitely now for the Pacers. Uh, he has surgery on his knee, the one that's been bugging him uh, for a while now. He had to have surgery to clear up pain, the Pacers said. Um, it, it is kind of newsy that this is a big deal. We haven't talked about him in a while, and I've seen Tice all the time, um, but the, the right knee's been bugging him. He's in the locker room being a good teammate, but it was so sore to the point that he had to have the surgery to clear up the paint. Now he's a he's a, like kind of an outgoing dude. He's a really good teammate. Again, I see him chatting it up uh, in the locker room all the time, which is good that he's good at all that because that is kind of his role this season and going forward. Definitely is because he's out indefinitely after having this surgery. And so uh, we, the backstory here, um, you have to go back. Right, he was on the Celtics last year. They play in the finals. That is through mid June, late June. Right, I think the last game they played was in the June twenties, and then. Less than a month later, like 20 days later, he's traded to the Pacers, right? So that's a wrinkle in his summer. He's got to travel here, made all that stuff. And then less than a month later, he's got to go to Europe for FIBA World Cup qualifying stuff and then Eurobasket. And while he's over there, he's got this sore knee. He almost doesn't play in Eurobasket. There was a report. I discussed it on this podcast if you were listening in the summer about his availability for Eurobasket on the German team being in question because of an injury. It was, as Carlisle has confirmed, that sore knee. He played anyway. Uh, and Eurobasket ends, they get third place nine days before Pacers training camp starts. So all this to say, thing after thing after thing, because the Celtics made it to the finals, and then he had all this stuff in the offseason. He really had no offseason, and he's been got hurt, right? So it was hard for him to kind of have time to recover, and then he was sick, like, right when he got here after traveling and, and training camp and stuff. But he hasn't had, like, uh, you know, we've only been able to talk to him, I think, once or twice this whole season, right? So, um he hasn't had any real recovery time. So in Chicago, about 2.5 weeks ago, the day Miles Turner debuted this season, 
I asked about Daniel Tice to Carlisle, you know, what's up with him? How's he doing? And he said that he was getting better at that point from the soreness. They thought it was just kind of an overuse thing. He was ramping up, working out a little bit with Turner at that time. But uh, clearly sometime between the, the, the announcement, I think was last Thursday, maybe last Friday, uh, sometime between that Chicago game and then the, the pain did not go away or subside in the way the Pacers hoped. Uh, with Tice, you know, he said that it was a decision between Tice and training staff, and they used a bunch of data, and everybody thought this was the best path forward, have this surgery, get rid of the pain, and, and proceed that way. Uh, and so from an encore perspective, eh, minimal impact, right? Like he, he, Tice probably wouldn't play anyway. In fact, almost certainly with you know Smith playing well and Turner playing well and Jackson playing well and even Batadze, you know, and they're winning against Detroit. Like he's had great moments this season. He wouldn't play, right? There's enough bigs in front of him that he wouldn't play. So I'd say the on-court impact is basically zero. That said, having depth is preferable to not, right? Like now, if the if the Turner trade offer that blows the Pacers away comes in, or um, two injuries happen, you know, Jackson got hurt last year. Turner's gets hurt in his past. Gogas had some injury past, right? All of a sudden, you know, they they could need him, right? Like it's not good to not have him. It's just it's not a big deal because they probably wouldn't play him anyway. But the other factor is he himself, Daniel Tice, is likely a trade candidate. You know, he's super far out of the rotation and is clearly better on a contending team, which maybe the Pacers are a playoff contender. I don't know. Uh, but he's clearly better on a contending team than a team like the Pacers who are exploring their young talent and happen to be winning a lot in the process. So it, it makes sense to, to for him and for the Pacers to prioritize his health long term and not his health on November 13th, right? So this all makes sense. There's no real impact on the court for the Pacers outside of if injuries start to pile up in the front court, they would almost certainly like to have him. So even though there's, you know, it, it's not great to have a guy having surgery, uh, it's a, it, it's, it's not a, you know, a lot of people were involved in this. So I don't think it's a big deal from the actual basketball perspective in terms of timeline. If there even is one, and he's out indefinitely, is what the release said. Um, I bet we could get an update like early December from Carlisle, but he did say they're going to bring him along slow. Again, why rush it unless there's injuries in the front court? Um, he he is a growing piece. Like Tristan Thompson played four games for the Pacers last year. Like they don't need a lot of big depth on this team given what they have from other guys that they can throw in who are young and talented. Like it, it's fine, but it does not, it's not good to not have the depth and guys having surgery. Obviously, uh, could be. A bad thing for their long-term perspectives we'll see but that's that you know he, he he he's been an off-court guy only all season looks like that will continue to be the case for tice but he's been nothing but great with teammates when i've seen him in interaction so far he was awesome with us for the media when we talked so some other depth pieces like james johnson like goga batadze we'll have to step up james johnson did have a back thing that caused him to miss uh saturday's game it didn't end up mattering but we'll see if that's a long-term issue either but for now uh tice still likely not to be back for a while after having uh, this surgery and will continue to be mo more of an off-court guy than an on-court guy. We'll see how long this keeps him out and off the floor uh, or, you know, what his timeline ends up actually being. Because right now, again, the Pacers are just listing him as out indefinitely. If you have questions about that or anything talked about today, Turner, the Pacers winning their upcoming schedule, you know where to hit me up. I'm on Twitter at TEastNBA until Twitter implodes into the sun and does not exist anymore. And this podcast is at Lockdown Pacers. You can listen to Lockdown Pacers for free every day wherever you get podcasts, and on YouTube where you can see my lovely face. Try it out again, like I said at the beginning, a new way to record today. So if there's any choppiness, the quality's bad, I apologize. Please let me know. Um, just trying to figure out the best way to do this every single day. Um, TBD on the schedule for this week, you know, Thursday, or excuse me, Wednesday, we'll be talking Hornets uh, and, and the Hornets rebuilding strategy and some other stuff from this week. We have practice availability tomorrow, so I'm sure there's going to be, uh, be a lot to talk about, but I'm not sure what that is yet until the games come coming Wednesday this week. So looking forward to that. Till then, everybody have a great rest of your day, and we will see you soon.